Well, if you have not seen The Greatest Showman, I hope that that inspires you to want to watch that fantastic movie about just a gang of misfits. They feel like real misfits and they um, are brought together uh, by the main character and it's, and it's uh, loosely based on the story of the beginning of Barnum and Bailey Circus. And interestingly enough, most actors feel like misfits in society. They feel um, like they're, they just don't really belong anywhere. And I do think that there is an interesting correlation there to how we often feel when we come up against the role of our life, that thing that we were born to do, oftentimes we can feel nervous at various moments in our life. So we'll be talking about those things today and a little more on Transformation Thursday. And so beginning with this message, I will say that the stage has been set. The marquee has your name on it. The crowd is lining up around the corner and you're in the dressing room awaiting the performance of your life. But how did you get here? And how do we know that you were meant for this moment? In fact, born for this role? Well, let's back up. It all starts with a casting call that you all have been invited to hear. And when you're new as an actor, it's more like a cattle call, meaning there's no one lining around the corner to see you. You're lining around the corner with a bunch of hopefuls. And both my acting career and my daughter's both started that way being in line, waiting to see if we could get picked for the role. My daughter was waiting to see if the agency would pick her up. And man, you just feel like one of a million that may ever get an opportunity to do this thing that you dream. You know, will it be you? Will you be picked? And in our lives, for all of us, whether or not you're an actor, you know, we sit and we look and we see all the variety of things that we could possibly do with our lives. We get asked that question in the in early days. What do you want to be when you grow up? And often as children, we go into the world of imagination and we think, what sounds like the most fun or the coolest thing to do? But then as we get older, we begin to think, now, what is the best thing that I could do? What's going to be the most money or maybe get me the most prestige? Whatever we define as success during those ages, those teenage ages where we're beginning to think about those things, those are the types of jobs that maybe we begin to think that we would want. Well, then moving on, you go from these cattle calls and as you um, begin your acting career, you often get special requests for your presence at the audition. And what I believe that would be a metaphor for is that instead of just looking at every potential career, at a certain point, uh, maybe a guidance counselor, or maybe it's just something that you learn as you go along, you think, well, look, I don't need to choose from all the different careers that are out there. I have certain gifts and skills and specialties and things that I am good at in particular. Um, and so I need to only be looking at those things and um, what is actually suited the most for me. You know, even in the arts, we uh, talk to people about their brand. You know, uh, now with the days of social media, you can really build your own audience. You don't have to wait to be picked. If you specify a particular like type of acting that you want to do, you can begin to garner a following on your own for those things and just create your own opportunities. And so that's what begins to happen to us as we go from the cattle call of life to more specific where you're being picked and chosen and you're being asked to be there. Well, before you know it, you're going from being in a large cafeteria with all the actors, or I remember in my early days, I got I, I had different jobs as a clown. I, I did all kinds of things, but I'd be crowded into classrooms with men and women. We'd be changing and just 
doing everything, you're kind of still all squished in together. You've got the job, but you're all squished in together until you go to those special roles where you have your own trailer with your name on it. Both my daughter and I have experienced that. Well, actually our name wasn't on it, the character, that's what they do, the character's name uh, on it at that level. And um, yeah, and so uh, what that reminds me of is scripture, Proverbs 18, 16. I'm just gonna turn to it here. And it says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. So you're really starting to, to move up there to, to more of the starring roles, to more of the choice uh, and prize positions, hopefully in what it is that you're desiring to do. And then our biggest goal would be to be uh, in this metaphor, Beyonce style, right? With your own stylist and attendants. And the scripture that I would put with that is Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man diligent in his business? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. And, you know, of course, all of these things come with real diligence, right? It's... um. When I would coach young actors, I would let them know that it's very important not just to think about talent. A lot of people think that you have to be born with it or things like that. I actually was a terrible actor in high school. Um, I was very self-conscious and that's something that you have to at least figure out how to mask if you're going to be a good actor because otherwise you're up there worrying the audience. Nobody wants to see someone that's like so nervous unless that's the character. And so I really became an actor out of pure desire. Not I wasn't really born with it, you could say. I mean, if I was born with it, I lost it somewhere along the way. I let these kids know that it's something that I studied. Um, the reason I actually ended up directing almost as much as I was acting is that's how I got into it. I just studied and studied by watching the actors and I, um, I desired it. And so those are some lessons on how we can transform our lives um, is by desire by focus by diligence and I gave myself over to that not even really believing that I could ever be good at it I wasn't sure but I just um I just wouldn't get away from it until I until I eventually um became what I was beholding and it is true that what you put before your eyes um, over and over and over again, you will become like that. That's why, you know, people often warn about the dangers of what you watch on television. If you consume yourself with something, you will grow yourself into that role. So we could call that one of our first lessons um, from acting. You know, if you don't necessarily have to be born with something. If it's what you want um, and you just keep giving yourself over to it, you can become that. And we know at the, those high levels, someone like Beyonce puts in hours like Michael Jordan used to do or any of your best basketball players or anything. It's a lot, it's physically intensive. It's a lot of training. You know, it, it takes your life. That's like Olympic level um, performance where you're really, you're not just relying on God-given talent or whatever you were given but you are making sure that you increase that with your dedication. All artists, whether they are actors or visual artists, go through a particular process where you study, 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 study. You study, um, you know, if you study in school, you study the history of acting. You look at all the different people that have done what you wanna do before you. Visual artists, they learn particular techniques, right? Um, you know, my daughter has taken voice lessons. We've both taken dance classes, right? You, you study the specific techniques, but you don't become an artist until you get to the level where you actually throw those techniques away. And, and you begin to now, you're able to go off of your instincts and you're able to put your own particular spin 
um, on, on those techniques. Um, I remember when I uh, learned how to cry, <laughs> I talked about that last week, um, that, you know, but that was something, I mean, you know, nobody has to teach you how to cry, right, when you're just as a human person, but, um, you know, to learn how to do it on command. And, uh, you know, I was taught these certain techniques, things to think of, but then I ended up landing on my own sort of, uh, it was really just one specific thing that if I, if I really think about that over and over and over, I can just kind of get myself to cry. And so I'm going to talk to you guys about getting ready for roles in particular. What do you do to get ready for roles? And there are three things regarding identity, uh, lessons that we can learn from acting as um, actors get ready for roles. And it's kind of going to be a little bit opposite of um, identity because I'm going to talk to you about things that sometimes we over identify. You, you know how sometimes you can learn what something is by learning what it's not. So I believe that this will kind of give us both perspectives on that. So the first thing is when you want to get into character, you have to get into the mind of a character. Okay. And so this one tell you this story. Um, when I directed uh, my senior thesis uh, at Princeton. I did an adaptation of the book, The Women of Brewster Place. And uh, if you um, were around in the 80s, Oprah Winfrey starred in the TV special of, uh, I really enjoyed that movie. Um, so anyway, uh, Princeton was not known for its acting. And so many of the people that were actors there, maybe had never even acted in high school or anything like that. Um, normally, if you were really into acting and you wanted to go to Ivy League school, you would go to Yale. So these would be people that maybe didn't have as much experience. I actually really enjoyed working with people like that. And the person that I cast as the villain in The Women of Brewster Place um, was a girl who had never acted before, but she just had the, the look uh, it's something you don't really want to tell people, but I asked her to audition and she just kind of had had this uh, mysterious. She didn't look evil. She just looked mysterious, like you wouldn't quite be sure what she was thinking. And she had a lower registered voice and she just would be perfect for this murderer. <laughs> so um, anyway, she read the part kind of just as herself, she said she would do it. She read the part, she was like, perfect. But when we got in rehearsal, she started freaking out about people thinking that she's a murderer. And so what I taught her to do was to be able to objectify this character and to not over identify with her own thoughts like, you can be able to think what someone else is thinking. And we're expecting the audience to be able to separate you from this character. So, but if you do not truly identify with the thoughts of this character, you're not gonna serve the audience very well because it's not, it's not gonna be well performed and then they're not going to believe it. And then they're not going to get the message of the story. And it's a really good story, right? So I was selling her on the benefits of this. And then once she got over that hang up, I taught her, you have to think anyone who has done anything wrong, which is all of us, right? But even down to a murderer, they had a reason for doing it. They think to themselves, if you didn't do this, I wouldn't have killed you. I mean, that's basically how a murderer thinks. And so um, you have to think like, why did they do this? And we all have that ability. We have that ability to think and to be able to understand each other. But sometimes if we over identify with our own thoughts and we think that the way I think is the only way that you can think, you can't really have that empathy for other people. And but if you, if you don't figure out 
why your character is doing what they're doing, you're not going to be able to play the role well. It's going to be a very surface portrayal, but it's not going to be believable. So that's one thing is being able to understand the way people think and not over identifying with your own thoughts. The next thing is looking the part, okay? And here, you know, the actors, uh, Marlon Brando, uh, even Hugh Jackman, we've seen do this. Oh, so many different actors, Tom Cruise, they've gained weight, right? Or they've really lost weight for their role. Uh, Matthew McConaughey, he's like a, another huge example of somebody who's gone to extremes of, of uh, changing up their looks for their parts. And so actors um, in that case uh, are sort of like musicians. Their body is just their instrument. And so they don't over identify with their body, that their body can only be one way. And I thought that that would be interesting for someone who's not an actor to think about. Do you think about your body as an instrument? Sometimes we over identify with the, our bodies. We think we are our bodies. And it, certainly if we struggle uh, with weight or anything like that, um, we can really think, oh, this is just who I am, you know, and these eating habits, it's just who I am. But actors show us that's not true at all, man. For a given role, they'll just lose all this weight, gain all this weight, uh, you know, hit the gym, gain all these muscles, you know. Um, they'll completely change their body shape to be believable for the role that they want to play. We can also see from that that whatever it is that we're wanting to do in life, we want to dress the part for it, right? We want to look like where we want to go. In fact, um, as part of my group coaching, uh, I have, a, it's called Virtual Vision University. And one of the things we do is we have vision parties and we come to the party as our future self. It is so much fun to think about who am I going to be in three years? How would I dress? What would I be talking about? This is going beyond the vision board and actually putting that new life on. And if you would like a group of people to, to do that with, please, you know, contact me uh, after. Um, you, can, you can find out through, through Oasis how to get in touch with me. But um, that's something actually we're going to be doing this week. So um, just so, so much fun to put on that new life, even to the place of how you're going to dress and how you're going to talk being in character for the life that we want to live. And then uh, our last lesson as we look at this is that you are not what you do. And do not over identify with what you do. So, you know, uh, for a time uh, when I first moved to this home, for the first time actually in my adult life, God allowed me to get like a regular job. Um, I always had things that were more, you know, um, contract basis or things like that, uh, businesses. But um, I, God allowed me to get a job because I was so freaked out about the rent here. So anyway, I worked at Amazon for a time in a warehouse. And, um, you know, I always tried to remember to keep separate, just like an actor. Like, this is just what I'm doing. This is not who I am. This is just for a season. But even if you enjoy what you do, as a spiritual lesson, let's remember that we're not our body and we're not even the thoughts that run through our head. We are spirit. We are spirit. And the way that we take care of our spirit, the way that we allow ourselves to grow and mature in the spirit determines the way in which we will play the role we've been called to play. Many of us are called to play many roles, right? Mother and father, wife, husband, um, you know, minister, um, you know, you, teacher. You may have your various roles. You could be a construction worker. You could be so many. Those are the roles you play. Those are externals. And sometimes, right, we are asked to play roles that maybe we don't care for. Um, 
But if you don't over identify, you know, sometimes, and this is something that can happen a lot with men, if they lose their line of work, they lose their identity because men identify with what they do, right? And that's part of their external nature. But we need to remember that we are not what we do. We are not what we think. And we're not our body. We are spirit. And because we are spirit, we are all connected. We're connected to the divine spirit. And once again, it is out of our relationship with divine spirit that we can do those things that we do with excellence and be brought to the highest levels, no matter what it is that you do. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity Asar for teaching everyone this morning and for even going into my own mind and thinking how these lessons can apply. I really enjoyed that. And I've got a lot of cool stuff to share with you all on Thursday about the history of acting, uh, sort of the nature of acting, staying in characters and some other things I had thought through. So looking forward to, to seeing you all at Transformation Thursday. Thank you. Awesome, Felicity. Thank you, Minister Felicity for the, the introduction of this conversation that I'm, I'm believing that you're going to really drill down in, not just into the upcoming week, but it may be something that you'll be able to help the community with because we all play a role. The word of God tells us whatever state you're in. So consider this, whatever role you're in, be content. And that is, you may be not be the leading character or your character may just fit in to a setting, but there come a point in time where all of us will have that leading role and we need to how to know how to get into it, how to immerse ourselves in it. And sometimes we have to learn how to shift out of old characters in order to be fully who we are. So I'm excited about what I've heard you share. And we're gonna go into the green room shortly and have a conversation with the um, those who are joining us this morning, both on Facebook Live and those who are in the Zoom room, um, don't go nowhere. We're going to have some conversation. And before that, I just want to say if this message has been a blessing to you and you want to be a blessing, not necessarily just to this ministry, but if you want to bless Minister Felicity directly, um, we're going to ask that Felicity, do, can you uh, share with us how an individual could um, bless you virtually if they desire to? Yeah, way. sure. So I'll um, put my cash uh, tag in the chat. It's um, dollar sign Felicity Solomon, F-E-L-I-C-I-T-Y. And then Solomon is all O's, like the character in the Bible. So yeah, right. thank you for that. Good. So those of you who desire to be a blessing, um, you can look in the Zoom room chat feed, or you can look in the Facebook Live in our um, director this morning, uh, v will put that in there. So let us um, slip over into the green room. Hopefully you got a chance to wet your whistle, um, you know, grab you some water, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. so let's check, yeah. start the conversation with asking you uh, a couple of questions. One of the questions, when an actor is typecast, mm -hmm. um, or what does that mean? Or, yeah, that's a good one. So typecast means that um, I, one of my favorite actresses was Meg Ryan growing up, but Meg Ryan pretty much only got to play like heroines in uh, romantic comedies. And it's like, whenever you looked at her, you saw like a sweet little blonde curly <laughs> uh, woman. So um, I, I remember one time she tried to step out and she got a, a role in a war movie and um it just was hard for people to see her that way um and so uh that that definitely is something that can happen so when you do something over and over and over and over again um that's how people begin to see you now you have to be very insistent if you ever want to break out of that so someone like jim carrey who was only seen in comedic roles for a very long time, but he wanted to be a serious actor. Same as Robin Williams. Um, they, they both wanted to do dr dramatic roles. And if you do that, you're gonna have to do that like over and over and over to be able to convince people. And eventually they were able to convince people that they could be more than the silly 
roles that they saw them in. Um, but yeah, so that's something if, you know, you can find yourself typecast in life, maybe, you know, you've been mom all these years and now, you know, the kids see you stepping out, you know, going dating or, you know, if you're divorced or going into a new career and it's hard for people to receive you that way. It definitely takes determination because I've seen actors be successful at that. But others, if they get bad reviews on that first one that they try to step out, they, they may quit and never really try. I could name several actors like that. But, but, you know, others say, no, this is what I know I can do this and I'm going to keep trying. Yeah. One of my favorite actors is Denzel. And I love him because he really knows how to get into a role. Um, he has played a myriad of roles and he knows how to drop in anywhere from being that cold hearted um, individual inside training day into being into glory or many other movies. Um, so when you talk about roles, is there a danger of being in a particular role and separating it from reality? Um, I think that uh... actors tend to develop their own boundaries over that. And so there are actors that don't want to be addressed as their um, anything but their character during a certain season. And, it, and when you hear of that, those do tend to be very intense roles. And then they just don't want to come out of it. Um, but I've never really heard of anyone slipping into character and not really being able to come out of it. It is pretty well defined for every actor that this is the time that I'm this character and this is the time that I'm myself. How about the guy who played the Joker? You you know that story? Uh, right, right. But I, I, from what I heard, he was depressed anyway. Already. So sometimes you can begin to play a role and that role just activates something that in you and it becomes reality for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I honestly, I do think that there would have to be a, a predetermined mental health thing going on. I would never be scared to play anything because that's all, every, every actor I know and for myself, it's really separated in my mind. Like, this is that person, this is me. It's not, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then all the, you, you know, all of your acting situations are pretty unnatural. Like you've got all these cameras and lights and, you know, you've got people looking at you, whereas in life, right, you don't really have that. So it's, it's all a little contained. Um, what, this is the time that I'm this and this is the time that I'm that. And then plus, when, the time too that, that I guess you'd be most susceptible is when you don't have any responsibilities outside of there. But when you leave there, like you have to go be mom or you have to go do this, you have to go to the bank. Like you have stuff you have to do, you know? And so- you know, the like, bank is the joker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So right. you get yeah. locked up. Right. So we got some people who have some questions. I see um, Trinity um, stated, so true. We are all stars in our own life. We play various roles every day in order to live our lives with others. Great topic. Who am I today? Who am I envisioning myself to be? Authentic actor, developing my authentic soul. Powerful, right there. Authentic actor. Every role you play leads up to that, that role, that, that stellar role that you get that, um, that Oscar from for. And that's what we should be on top of. So um, V, you see anything else out there? I um, mean, someone who has a question or some a comment that was stated that um, Felicity may want to drill down in this morning. Good morning. Great message, Felicity. Um, yes, we had a hand up this morning. I believe it was from, hold on, I lost her. Maybe she put it down. Hold on, guys. I had a hand up this morning. Are you still there? Bessie Page, that's who got their hand up. Good morning, Bessie, how are you? Can you hear us, Bessie? Good morning. Her hand is up, but Cheryl Rogers, you're unmuted. While we're giving Bessie a moment, were you gonna talk? 
Well, I just like to say, uh, ironically, I had a, a similar conversation about playing a role with one of my coworkers. I'm a teacher. I teach science and the young lady is a fifth grade teacher and she was saying you know this is what we do every day we come in here and we put on our teacher role hat and then we become the teacher and we talk to the students we direct the students and whatever they need for us to do that's what we do and then if they say oh you need improvement in this area we say okay we put on another hat and we do something else so every single day we are actors in our own right in our own space but as soon as we come away like for myself when I come away from the school then I become who I am Cheryl sister friend mom confidant whatever my other role is so this was like right in line with what was just occurring in my thought processes so thank you very much you're welcome. You know, it reminds me too of a conversation I had with a young man recently who was having some troubles. Uh, he's a young adult and having troubles with his mom. And um, he's like, this is so strange because like, I didn't really have troubles with her growing up. And I said, well, here's the thing. Cause you know, I also have a teaching background. I was like, um, as parents, the mom and dad that you get to know as a child isn't always who that mom and dad is like and the other thing is children are gullible and you can be whoever you want with a child children believe you and if you know how to just be kind like in their face and stuff like that like they take you as that as like but now you're getting to know who your mom really is and other adults have trouble with her too, but this is like the reality of it, you know? And so that's something to be cognizant of as parents that we don't just play a role with our children, like let them know who you are and let who you are be who you want them to know. <laughs> like, because we have, that's part of the gift of becoming a parent is you can up level who you are. But anyway, that's kind of what that reminded me of. Awesome. So you mentioned one of the scriptures. You mentioned two scriptures, um, one of which is uh, my favorite scripture. That's Proverbs twenty two and twenty nine, um, and from the Amplified, it says, "Do you see a man diligent and skillful in his business? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men." And so that's really uh, something that I always will. Um, restate to myself as I get in the role, like if I'm going to present somewhere, if I'm going to work, if I'm out in the street, I want to personify a man who is diligent, I'm skillful um, in what I do in my business, in my role. And because so many of us have not taken on the due diligence to be skilled in our authentic self, our authentic role that we've been called to walk in, we find ourselves taking up other people's space and we become mediocre, we become uh, mundane, we become average, we become like everybody else. You're not making any noise because you're not skillful. So when, the, when you um, agreed to speak, I know we were gonna deal with, um, begin the, the, the topic of, um, of money, um, you were gonna to share, but then this, I heard in the spirit, it says, what is she skilled at? Um, mm -hmm. And that dropped in. And then when I was preparing the advertisement, I said casting call. And I didn't give you any specific direction. I knew that you knew what to do with that. And so as we um, go deeper into this week, I want you guys to really give some thought to what role you are playing. And are you playing it well? And is it a season where that role is over? Is that, is the, when's the final act for that role? And you can always reinvent yourself. You can always come forward. The key is to find out what role do you, should you be playing versus the role you want to play? Yes, yes. Anything else out there, V, or anything else you want to share, Minister Felicity? We have a hands up by Courtney Bates. And I just wanted to make sure I get that. Good morning, Courtney. Good morning. How's everyone? Wonderful. Good. Thanks for asking. Hope you're Good. well. Good. I am. Um, I a few things definitely resonated with me. I really like the part about um, getting into character and, you know, 
basically carrying yourself in the manner in which um, the, the person who you want to be uh, would be in that particular role. Like if you see yourself abundant, if you see yourself um, living a peaceful, harmonious life, then you can basically take on that role right now. You can feel like that person. You can speak like that person. You can have mannerisms like that person. Um, you can you can get into how this person would think, what this person's responses to life would be, and you can embody that now as you make the transition into that role. So I, I that really uh, did resonate uh, with me. And then um, I also like what Greg said about um, you can be in a role and you can become mundane and you, you know, and, and not make any noise. And I'm really thankful because I've been in the industry that I'm in for 25 years, um, mostly on, but maybe a little bit off. I tried to do a couple other things, but you know, and I've worked for myself and I've been successful, more successful actually when I worked for myself um, doing the same thing. But I feel like for the first time, I really made some noise. For the first time, I'm really making noise and, and I'm proud of that. And I just believe it's just a, a new way of looking at what I do and how I do it. Um, for the first time in my life, um, I have merged my spirituality with my work you can and I think and and I think people want to know what my secret is because of all the accolades and everything that I've gotten at work and how you know people how happy people are with me and my performance and my secret is is that I, I put love in everything I do so even if it's work I can still choose to love my coworkers. I can still do my job with the attitude of service and, and love in my heart. And I, I really do apply it to, to what I do. And when I, when I step outside of that and when I away from that, that's when I, that's when I struggled the most, but overall I kept that. And, and that really impacted how my service was delivered and how it was received. And so I'm thankful for the noise that I've been able to make. I, I feel like I've changed uh, the, traje the trajectory of the company uh, for good by the things that I have done and the things that I have displayed while working there. Yes. You know, the exciting thing, Courtney, about this season in your life is that um, you're going to be like one of those um, TV series that stopped in its prime. Mm -hmm as opposed to one that had to be canceled because it got tired, right? Yeah. And, and, and you know, to be like an athlete or something that leads at the top of their game and, um, you know, then is kind of promoted to the next level of what they can do in life is a very exciting thing. You know, um, we can all think of, you know, long running series that have been like that. They ended with a bunch of spinoffs because they were so good had so many good characters that other shows were able to spin off from it, you know, but then there are those that just stay too long, right? And become long in tooth and no one wants to watch anymore. And all you can remember is the glory days of it. So, you know, always be someone that leaves at the top of your game, leave them wanting more, as they say, right? It's a, a fan, fantastic thing. So I want to say that the chat is so on fire today. Yes, Gee, I know. You could, um, make yeah, sure I you send me. Yeah, make sure you send me the chat because I know that there were a lot of things I was, I was speaking to. I want to be able to read all of that. Definitely. We have a lot in the chat. And I just, I have to kind of multitask quick because I know we're short on time. But Marcella in our Zoom chat says, yes, being the main character in your life story mean we can be whomever we want. However, me, however, we're the director that instructs us to be great. This is the unnameable God. Thank you, Felicity. The show must go on. We can win Oscars or Emmys. I like that. Thank you, Marcella, so much. A lot happening on Facebook, too. My mom, who is live with you, says, I appreciate the analogy of living your character role. Thank you, Sandra Harrison, mom. You can control how the world sees your role. Liz Thurman on Facebook then says, duality of self. Some, sometimes one gets trapped in a role they are playing displaying to the world and believing about themselves 
sometimes at the detriment of themselves and their relationships. I'd like to speak to that. That's an interesting spin. I'm going to read that again from Liz Thurman on Facebook. Duality of self, sometimes someone gets it trapped in a role that they are playing, displaying to the world and believe it about themselves, sometimes to the detriment of themselves and relationships. Is that something one of you could speak on or care to speak on? Felicity can go first if she would like to share something, but I do, I want to step into that also. Yeah, go, no, you go ahead, Greg. No, you go ahead, no. <laughs> Y'all are hilarious, someone that go That was ahead. me being kind that I didn't have anything. Now I have to say I didn't really have anything. I mean, <laughs> what it what it reminds me of is uh, actually God changed my name. My my given name was uh, Nisha, which is very pretty, but it's a Swahili word with a double entendre, and my Whole Wait, life. Say it again. My given name was Tatanisha, which is not a name. It is a Swahili word. And anyone who knows Swahili that ever met me would say, do you know what your name means? And I'm like, yes, because I found out in college that it actually wasn't, uh, wasn't desirable. It is nothing that uh, someone who knows Swahili would name their child. Um, so anyway, uh, but it's like, share it, with us? Yeah, it was like a joke. It was like a joke. It was a double entendre. It meant like, because uh, in the English books, we would say it meant problem solver, but it really meant problem solver or problem causer, or you think you're a problem solver, but you cause more problems than you solve. It was like that. Wait, wait, so, wait, 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 wait. There's some depth there. I think it was prophetic in nature because- Oh, look at there's no do. doubt it was. Look at what you do. Look at the conversation you lead on the other side. Mm -hmm. So your name- really has some significance to what you become. Yes, very much so, very right. much so. And I lived a double life for a long time. I was a chronic liar as a little girl. I and mean, it was like when I would open you my- You was mouth, an actor, you wasn't a liar. <laughs> well, that's how I saw, I said what I saw in my head. It just wasn't actually true, any of it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I, my marriage, everybody thought it was one thing and it was another thing. So uh, when God changed my name, he said, okay, so we're not going to be doubling anymore. It's going to be felicity, which means happiness and joy, which is sustainable. So yeah, no, and it's not, it's not all bad. I don't look at that as all bad. It was definitely who I was meant to be. And I wouldn't know what I know if I didn't travel that road. Yes. So I'm also, oh, you know, I'm a sapiosexual. Um, you, you're double on uh, double entendre. French word. Help us out with that. Come on. We well, expand on here on Serendipity Sunday. It's just a, fa a fancy way to say double meaning. It has two meanings. That's all. Thank you. But uh, <laughs> but they a lot of times would use it in flirting. <clears throat> you know, you can say things when you're flirting with people that it, you know, you're saying one thing, but you mean another. And that way you can say, I wasn't meaning, I didn't mean that. If yes, did. exactly. I was just joking. I don't want your number. <laughs> right, right, right. Good. So um, so the question, Liz had a great one about um, duality. And so one of the things when we, so Oasis Spiritual Center for Divine Living is uniquely and, and intentionally, intentionally created for people who have had the African experience at, at various levels. And so one of the things I've seen is that the, um, our experience, uh, our group experience many times have kept us from our walking into our authentic experience. Okay, so like you can be born into a family that is, was known for certain things, very gangsterish, put it like that. Did a lot of um, grimy things. And then so you are typecast in that, or you can be born black. And because you're born black, you automatically feel that the world is stacked against you. Everybody's out to get you and you attract those kinds of things into your life. So we, we always have to be conscious of what um, the, the duality and we have to walk inside of the oneness of this. I and the father are one. I am, I show up, even when I show up in my worst day, I'm showing up as an, as an aspect of God and identifying through the contrast, identifying through the stuff that you say is a barrier 
as to what your work is to work through it. And it's not about working on or changing other people, is it about changing yourself? Um, I'm seeing a, a lot of uh, conversation now come to the top about, you know, the police need to do this. We need to police the state. No, you need to police yourself. When you look at all these things that are happening, particularly in the uh, African American community, it's happening in the community. It's not being imposed on the community. Some of it may be due to um, things that have happened in the past, but it's also because you're still running that role. Um, so that's um, this whole conversation that we're just kicking off. I think it's something that we really need to um, spend some time. And I look forward to Thursday night when Felicity is going to go deeper into um, whatever direction that the spirit is leading her. Uh, but I think this is going to pop off into to something something else. So that comment um, Liz made, duality of self, sometimes one gets trapped in a role they are playing. And many times people are playing, African-Americans, I'm speaking specific, we play the role of victim, of things have happened. Yes, things have happened to us. And they only continue to happen to us if we are kept in that conversation. That's not my experience. You know, that's my group experience, but that's not my experience. So you have to you have to play your role so well when somebody bump up against you and try to put you into a lesser role, you to go strongly into your role and it just wipes them out. Um, so that that's that's important. Um, but you do what you need to do to show up as your authentic self. Awesome. So good. Um, so good. You're, you're right. As I was writing this, I was like, there's so much to say on this. Like, and um, I, when you said it initially, it really birthed something in me. And like you said, something I can uniquely speak to. So I really appreciate that. And even going down the trail of duality, I mean, I'm a Gemini as well. And, and just what you were talking about, um, I've been uh, really in conversation with some Africans lately that have been such a blessing. And I think that that peace would be something we don't look at in the African-American community is how important it is to really have some community with Africans um, as well as maybe going to visit Africa, things like that, because there's a healing that has to happen there that can happen on a, in a group experience. There are ways that they speak that African-Americans don't, that we really need to pay attention to. There is a lot there. So Anyway, yeah, thank you for thank you for kicking this off. And um, just going, you know, my final thought is just to say, based off something Greg had said earlier, don't just rely on your natural gifting, right? But always seek to to um, expand on what you've been given and really grow it, just like the parable of the talents. It's not just about what you have in your hand but what you can do through your ingenuity and through your creative godlike spirit um, with that, what's in your hand and grow it into something greater. The power is with you. Awesome. Well, I, I wanna thank you, Minister Felicity for taking on this conversation. And I'm gonna ask if um, Pastor Annie Clark, um, she's here with us today, if she would prepare herself to close us out in prayer. And I want to say there is a gentleman by the name of Neville Goddard. Um, back in the early 1900s, Neville Goddard was an actor. Um, he was from Barbados. He has written some phenomenal things that we have yet to really consume and embrace, regurgitate. And when we do, we're going to find that he has given us a key. And he talks about this whole concept of playing a role. He talks about how he would play a role and how he would take the role on. And he would not be the role from afar. He would not be the role watching himself as the role, but he will be in the role. And so the word of God says to all of us, let to learn to be present right here, right now. So Pastor Annie, I asked if you will come on and you will close us out in prayer. Is there anything you would like us to know before we go um, um, V this morning? We did have some hands up, but you know what I'm going to say? You all can drop them in the chat here since we're okay. short on time and we can get them over to Felicity. Would you do that? And Absolutely. I'm going to make sure I copy the chat for Felicity. Thursday night. Don't forget, guys. We'll be here Thursday night. Thursday night, 7 p.m. Well, if you missed anything or didn't get to ask your question, Thursday's the time. I am unmuting Reverend Clark here. 
Reverend Clark, are you there? Good morning. How are you? Okay, I asked her to unmute. Let's see if she's there. Okay. Same here, Felicity. This was a great message. But we're waiting for her. There are a few more things in the chat box. Dorothy Roberts is saying we grow into ourselves using the mirror of life to create who we are. Sandra, my mom, says my children are my spinoff. That was cute. You mentioned a spinoff and how life could spin off. And let's see, do we have Reverend Clark here? She's not unmuted for me, Greg. Okay, she might have dropped off. So I'm just gonna ask that you close your eyes right here, right where you are and just take a deep breath in. Filling up your diaphragm, expanding your lungs to full capacity, holding that breath. Now releasing it, relaxing. Breathing is a great metaphor of the abundance. Breathing is a great metaphor of knowing when to let go, when to receive, and let us step into the prayer. Divine source, creator of all things, we thank you for the time that we have spent we thank you that you have created us in such a fashion that we have the ability to recreate ourselves in the midst of whatever we may be going through. We thank you that we play our roles to the hilt and that we know when to shift and when to change, and when to take on a new role, when to go into the understudy and when to go as the lead. And as we prepare ourselves to walk into this new day, this now day called today, that we'll show up as our greatest, greatest self. And when we lay our heads to our pillows before we drift off into the night, that we'll reflect on the role that we've played and that we won't go into judgments, but we will be present to lessons learned. That when we rise on the next, the next day, the now day, that we'll be called today, that we'll find ourselves able to show up bigger, better, and, be and greater. And so we thank you for there's no judgments. We thank you and so it is. Amen. Amen. Yeah.